September and already since then had uh, many visitors in, in the school uh, or two and we're very happy to, uh, to, to welcome everyone into a very safe and very cautious and, uh, and uh, highly uh, regulated, of course, uh, area. But we will welcome all of you from Johannesburg that would like to come to us. Uh, join our coffee shop, Easy's, have a nice cappuccino before the uh, Chagim. So please feel free to come in and join us. Now, in today's webinar, Jacob will take us on a whirlwind visit to Austria and Hungary. We are honored to ha have with us Holocaust survivors again tonight. We have, uh, of course, Pinchas Guter, uh, our wonderful friend and survivor from Toronto uh, joining us tonight. And we have with us uh, from Johannesburg, Veronica Phillips, who was born in Budapest and uh, survived three concentration camps and uh, is also with us tonight. It is such a pleasure to welcome Jacob again. And let me introduce you, him officially to you, especially those that did not hear him in the last uh, meeting. Jacob was born in Jerusalem and he's one of the most celebrated tour managers, educators and guides who has visited 107 countries and led tours in 66 countries on six continents. He's fluent in 15 languages and his background has expertise in Holocaust studies, Sephardic Jewish heritage, Jewish museology and so much more. Jacob is a friend and a colleague for, and for the past 15 years, we worked together leading the March of the Living South Africa and international groups uh, to Poland and Israel. And Jacob also took March of the Living groups to the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. It is a real pleasure to welcome you again to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Looking forward to learn from you tonight. The floor is yours. You are on mute, Jacob, my dear, you are on, on mute. Hi, thank you. So good afternoon, good evening, good night, good morning, whatever you guys might be. Thank you for joining us today. It's a special privilege to be able to be with uh, everybody, especially the survivors who are around us, who have inspired us and will continue to inspire us to carry on the special message and the special knowledge and the special awareness and concern and involvement in Holocaust education with the attempt to try to make a point that such things will never happen again, not to us and not to any other people. And thank you for your inspiration. We took upon ourselves something which is almost like a mission impossible. How can we encompass history, centuries, of uh, history of uh, great nations occupying big chunks of the European continent. But we'll try to do that. We are doing, as you might know, it, we are doing it in two parts. Today we will do, oh, sorry, I forgot to figure the pointer, that's it. Today we will do Budapest and Vienna with a little outside of these two cities. And in the next time we meet, we will do Slovakia and Czech Republic, but everything is within the context, within the realm of what used to be the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So beginning with Hungary, of course, with the capital of Budapest, and some of you were talking about Hungarian ancestry and you will be talking about Hungarian Jews. And what is interesting is that Hungarian language is not restricted only to Hungary, but you will find Hungarian speaking people in many of the different countries around Hungary. For whatever reason, during the various wars, somehow Hungary ended up on, often on the losing side, so they have lost territory. And as a result, the population that spoke Hungarian, including many Hungarian speaking Jews, ended up in the various other countries. The tour that we will take, as I mentioned, will start in Budapest to Vienna. The next time we'll travel from Vienna to Bratislava, 
and will end in Prague. Hungary, look at the size of the country, look at the population and the shocking figures. Can you imagine, we cannot even know how many Jews live there. You ask the official authorities, the Jewish community, the different organizations, the rabbis, and the numbers will vary anywhere from 50,000 to 150,000 because many people will not identify. Many people will not step forward and join Jewish organizations for very good reasons to whatever it is that they will tell you what has motivated them not to do so. What we do know, look at the figures before the war, 861,000 murdered in the Holocaust, nearly half a million of the Hungarian Jews. The brief history of Hungary should mention that the Hungarian nation is a newcomer to Europe. Actually, they are among the last waves of immigration who came from the Asian steppes and from Mongolian uh, areas. Uh, they have reached Europe and settled in Hungary only in 897 of the common era, which is quite interesting because we are going to talk later on about the Jews who settled there. How about the Jews who settled there in the first and second century? So the Jews have preceded Hungarians by so many centuries. I talked about the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the different ethnic groups. Look at the size of that huge empire that occupied big chunks of Central and Southern and Eastern Europe only to be broken into pieces and into smaller uh, political national entities at the end of World War I. The tour we'll take will be a combination of travel through these beautiful countries, emphasis on Jewish travel, and then the Jewish experience during the war and the unfortunate uh, events that unfolded. We come to one um, of the most beautiful cities in Europe, nestled along the Danube River. One of the most dominant features will be this House of the National Assembly, have been in use since 1902 and in different hours of the day and night beautiful appearance from various angles from various directions beautifully lit at night where i highly recommend everybody who comes there you should take a very nice night cruise an hour cruise on the danube they give you narration in many different languages and they point out the various sites that we look at driving and sailing under the beautiful majestic bridges connecting the two parts of the city. On the right hand side is Pest, on the left hand side is Buda, and the town, the city of Budapest actually is the time, is the place where at uh, one time they have merged and combined the Buda and the Pest with another smaller neighborhood that we might not uh, uh, no, which is Obuda. Anyhow, now it's a very large town, the capital of Hungary. Look at this gorgeous church. That is the Matthias Church, right on the uh, Buddha side, overlooking the Danube and the rest of the city. Something very special is the very special tile work we'll see in many places. They have a special factory producing tiles in the interiors of the church are absolutely amazing, beautifully done. Overwhelming majority would practice Catholicism. Then you would have the various other ethnicities between uh, Eastern Orthodox and some um, uh, Lutherans and Protestant churches from various denominations that will make up the uh, town or the population of the country and the city, of course. We have exited the church and we take a nice walk on the Fisherman Bastion. It's a beautiful promenade that was set up in 1897 when Hungary have celebrated its 1000th anniversary, the arrival of the different Hungarian tribes who came from the steppes and the Eastern regions of Asia and settled in this place, offering magnificent views of the city and the bridges from that promenade. I personally like these tiles because some of them 
look, these, are these pictures are taken from the roofs of the buildings. So they put the tiles even in places where nobody could see them before we had drones and airplanes, and yet they've decorated the city so beautifully with the tiles. I mentioned the bridges, also the bridges are beautifully illuminated. And as I mentioned, connecting the two parts of the city. On the Buddha side, another prominent feature is the Royal Palace, which is now the National Gallery in the Castle District with beautiful architectonic elements, with gorgeous views over the city, magnificent interiors, European beauty and exquisite decoration uh, as you could possibly have seen. And everything is so saturated with history. For example, imagine to hear that this is where Haydn has performed the creation the first time in this very hall. So everything echoes and vibrates so much history and so much, uh, e so much um, elements from the past as viewed in this uh, city nowadays. I have to tell you that many of the items we see have been reconstructed. The city was bombarded heavily. We'll talk about the war to a point that people People sometimes didn't know who was bombing them. Was it the British or the Russians? From which side were the bombs uh, coming onto the city? And everything has been painstakingly, beautifully restored into its former magnificent beauty. And you really will love many of the elements. Crossing to the other side, from the Buddha to the Pesh side, we see the most important basilica, St. Stephen's Basilica. And it is located in the heart of the city along the main drag of the Andrashi Boulevard, where we have some magnificent uh, buildings between some of the nicest hotels. Look at this one, for example, the Four Seasons Hotel. Uh, this one in particular overlooks the Danube. I mean, it's, it's like a palatial creation, just absolutely magnificent. And not far, we have the pedestrian street, the Vatsi Utsa, where we will have lots of the eateries, the shops, the boutiques and coffee shops, shopping uh, in, uh, that is done here in the central part of the city, Vatsi Utsa. One of the claims to fame, I don't know where, what is the practice in your places, but I'd like to rectify maybe something which is an injustice that was done. Sometimes you go to a special event, they cater a magnificent wedding or some other festivities, and when the desserts will come, everybody will call it a Viennese table. Sorry to disappoint, it's Hungarian. The Hungarians told the Viennese how to make their magnificent cakes and desserts, and we will step into one of the loveliest coffee shops. This was a family who came from France, but they adopted to the local traditions the Gerbo Cafe, and that's where everybody goes after their amazing, amazing cakes. They're really special, and the whole area evokes old world charm with the wood panels and all these nice metals and illumination. I, I shouldn't do that before dinner, but this is a sour cherry strudel served warm with a chilled vanilla cream sauce. And I think I'll conclude with that before we will be dragged into some other things. The other thing is the poppy seed. And with that, we'll move on and leave the culinary part. But that's something that I had to tell you because it certainly is a major claim to fame of Hungary. We travel in the Pesh side to the far end of the uh, Andrashi Boulevard and we come to the Hero Square. That's where they have many of the national monuments the heroes are the chieftains of the tribes who arrived here in the ninth century. And right below is the tomb of the unknown soldier with the guards protecting it. And as you noticed, if I didn't mention it, I'm sorry, you're all gonna get at the end of this presentation, you're gonna get the full presentation since I was not able and will not be able to talk about at length or about each and every one of the sites. I've embedded dozens and dozens of links to websites. So when you get the presentation at your leisure on your own, you can click and read much more 
about the various places that we are uh, presenting here in this presentation. That square has two magnificent museums. One of them is the Fine Arts Museum and the other one across the street is the uh, Hall of Art. Uh, one of them showing uh, classical and the other one will show some of the more modern art and the buildings themselves are stunning. We'll start talking a little maybe about a Jewish point and the interiors of this restaurant is something everybody should experience if you go there. This is Gundel, a restaurant that was set up uh, in the 19th century, fell into disrepair, and when the Soviet Union was collapsing and new winds started blowing, people thought that Budapest will be maybe the new Hong Kong of Europe. So two very clever and uh, people with good taste, very nice Jewish guys. One of them was George Lang of the Café des Artistes fame, and the other one is Ronald Lauder. They bought and invested fortune in this restaurant, turning it into a magnificent place. Budapest happens to be located in a valley which was uh, created as a result of major tectonic movements, big plates that moved around in that part of Central Europe, and as a result, it has lots and lots of hot springs, and that's another very typical pastime. And the hot springs, look at the buildings, the spas, they look like palaces themselves. They are very, very nice and very special uh, places to go and have a dip, maybe get a massage or something, uh, relax from the tours that you take. Look at the beautiful ceramic, the artwork decorating the interiors of the spa. Of course, the marketplace, again, a very beautiful, colorful marketplace. The interiors are absolutely stunning, offering anything and everything under the sun, not only in the food, but also in arts and crafts and special handicrafts, uh, folk art that is being presented in the market. The city has lots of culture. This is, as I said, Europe at its best, so they have a magnificent opera. And in addition, they have something which is typically Hungarian, that's an operetta. So these are pieces of music and theater on the lighter side. Many of the pieces were written by Jewish authors who were very active here in the 19th and early 20th century. And it is beautifully decorated, golden panels and whatever. And something I definitely recommend to go and spend a nice quiet evening in the Operetta Theater. For those of you who care for modern dance, it's a magnificent new modern dance theater. And I'd like to, as we take a walk, that's something that for me I think is very important to highlight. This is the house where Ignaz Semmelweis lived. You know who Semmelweis was? The doctor who in the 19th century has saved the life of thousands and tens of thousands of women. Today, maybe we could count millions. He was the one who figured that the doctors who were just performing whatever surgery should simply wash their hands before they went to deliver babies. Can you imagine? Half the babies would die. Half the women give delivering would die because the doctors didn't realize to do, <laughs> they should do something simple. So I think we should pay respect to this very special man. Comes now the time as we approach to talk about the um, different uh, locations and what happened here that has led uh, the story to unfold the way it did. Hungary collaborated with the Germans. That was a choice taken by the dictator who ruled the country for decades. They sent Hungarian soldiers with the German soldiers to fight in the war. Imagine they sent Jewish soldiers were recruited and they went to fight in Russia. 42,000 Hungarian Jews died being soldiers of the Hungarian army who joined forces with the Germans to fight against the Russians. What Hungary tried to achieve was to regain the properties that were lost following the big treaty uh, in Trianon in 1920 the nations have kind of carved Hungary and gave pieces of Hungary, as you see, to Slovakia, to 
to Ukraine, to Romania, to Serbia, to Croatia, to Austria. So they hoped to regain the territories and that explains why did they join the war. We'll begin now visiting Jewish Budapest, looking first, of course, at this magnificent synagogue we'll visit. I know that some of you visited the Hungarian, the Jewish Museum in Budapest in 89. It has changed completely. A beautiful new exhibition was set up just in the last couple of years, showing some magnificent artifacts and historical uh, documents and all kinds of beautiful pieces in the museum. The area there where the Jewish quarter used to be was a rundown place for many, many decades following the war and following the communist regime. And guess what happens now? This is the new Soho. This is the most coveted place. That's where all the fun takes place, where the young and the old, everybody comes to the various eateries and the pubs and bars and galleries, all kind of off and off, off and off, off, off in theater, in performance, in music, in dance, very busy activity in the former Jewish quarter. But uh, we have something else in mind after we look at all this stuff and admire some of the buildings. Some of them were absolutely stunning before the war. Now many of them could use more than a pint of paint. But you can imagine that's where the uh, very special group of people who lived here, the Jews, who constituted almost a third of the population of the city during many periods, to the point that the city was called by some people Judapest, to say that the Jews were so dominant. When the dictator came to power, Horty, he said, I cannot stand it, that every newspaper, theater, uh, publications, publishing houses, factories, shops, law offices, clinics, are all owned by Jews. So you can imagine that the Jews played a very important role in the social and economic fabric of the city. Again, we come and talk about the museums. The names of the museums in, um, in Budapest are the names of the streets where they are located. So this, for example, is the Rumbach Street Synagogue. I mention it because even before the big atrocities and deportations started already, at the onset of the war, the Hungarians on their own initiative rounded up Jewish people who were not Hungarian citizens. They fled from Poland after the occupation, they came from various countries and they were deported. They gathered them at this synagogue. That was the departure point. That was the roundup place and the departure point where they sent them uh, away and on to various uh, camps and whatever. Another uh, story that we have to talk, and I put here uh, the link, and you'll read about the Kamenets Podilski massacre, a major massacre that took place, but you'll read about it in the link, and it was the Jews who were deported from this area and were sent east, and where they were massacred by the thousands, and just to show you the kind of route that they had to take 11 hours by train now, so it must have been much longer at the time, to this uh, region in the Western Ukraine. We'll come to the main synagogue, the famous one, the Dohani Street uh, Synagogue. Dohan is tobacco, so must, some, somebody must have sold tobacco at one point to give the street the name before the synagogue was built. And this is the second largest synagogue in the world, second only to the one in New York, with very interesting architecture influenced by the theology of the synagogue. This synagogue, like many others in Budapest, belongs to a very special uh, movement in Judaism, which is called the Neolog, the Neolog Judaism. So they try to combine the old, the traditional with the new spirit with the new winds that blew through the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the 19th century. And today, the ones who do practice and the ones who do go to uh, the synagogues and participate in organization and so on, most of them belong to the Neolog school and otherwise we have 
uh, totally of about 20 different synagogues. All the, uh, most of the others will be orthodox, but they are much smaller. This synagogue is one of the most beautiful synagogues you could possibly see anywhere. Uh, influenced a lot by Moorish style, they looked for something that will resonate antiquity and where do you have antiquity? Old synagogues that existed from the 14th, 15th centuries. So lots of the motives are taken from the Spanish uh, style and thousands of people can gather and sit here. The ladies have two galleries actually uh, on top, but today most often they will not, and except for some of the high holidays and special events, gentlemen will sit on one side and ladies will sit on the other side. We will exit the synagogue and look at the backyard. This was another small synagogue that was set up for the veterans, the Jews who returned from the battle after World War I, and they created their own little community and their own synagogue in the courtyard of the major synagogue. In the middle of the courtyard, we have a memorial park. Of course, everybody knows Raoul Wallenberg, and this is Raoul Wallenberg Holocaust Memorial Park. There is a big willow tree made out of metal, and the leaves of the metal tree carry the names of the victims, so people can honor and mention and commemorate their relatives who perished in the Holocaust, who were murdered in the Holocaust by adding one more leaf to the hundreds and hundreds of the branches. By the way, the active person behind this project, which is done by many people, is somebody you know, Tony Curtis, whose father is from Budapest, and uh, he is, as I mentioned, one of the movers and shakers in the creation of this monument. It is absolutely a beautiful and very inspiring monument. I cannot show you pictures of the small names because it wouldn't uh, be seen properly, but uh, this is something very special and everything has to do with, of course, Raoul Wallenberg. Even though you know a lot and I've embedded these uh, links and you can read about him and watch so much footage and hear so many lectures about him, we still have to highlight this amazing person because thanks to his insistence, persistence, his incredible personality, the guy by then, by the way, is only 32 years of age when he came here in July 44, almost before it was too late. Yet, his initiatives helped save the life along with the other diplomats, some of them will mention, of over 100,000 of the Budapest Jews what an incredible person. One of the things that he did, he, of course, he had to uh, insist, one of the few people who dared, I would compare it to like stomping and hitting on the desk with uh, Roosevelt. He went because, you know, with all due respect to the great United States of America, unfortunately, the reaction to what was uh, being uh, heard about the Holocaust about the mass murders in Europe did not resonate. Uh, Henry Morgenthau wrote in his memoirs uh, that the uh, information about the Wannsee Conference, you know, the Wannsee Conference is January 20th, 1942. In August 42, the American government was briefed about this information and for the next 18 months, nobody did anything about it. And it was Wallenberg who came and finally uh, his insistence led to the foundations of the refugee board. He came and he took some houses, he put the Swedish flag on houses and the Swedish embassy supposedly have issued, you see his signature, Wallenberg, Raoul Gustav, and they issued these Schutz pass. Schutz means protection, protection papers or Schutz papieren, they called them in German. And that has secured, at least for a while, that has secured uh, passage and continued living of the many people who are given these documents. In this courtyard, we have the names, in addition to Raoul Wallenberg, of many other righteous among the nations, non-Jewish people who helped save uh, Jewish people. I'd like you to later on read the story about the monument to 
Wallenberg. Wallenberg, you know, right after the war, when the Russians came in, for whatever reason, they captured him and he was never seen again. And today, the most commonly accepted notion is that he was killed or died uh, at such a young age in 1947, July 4th, 1947 is the day quoted. They created the statue for him which the Russians had removed. And only years later, they created another statue commemorating the original one. So, as I mentioned, Wallenberg was not alone. Some of you have mentioned Karl Lutz, one of the relatives of a friend who joined us today. Some of the relatives were rescued by Karl Lutz. He was the Swiss diplomat. And not far from the Wallenberg Square, we will stop and admire this magnificent work of art dedicated to Karl Lutz. Uh, Switzerland was neutral during the war, of course, so the embassy continued functioning. And as a diplomat, he was able to issue documents that protected these people. Look, he comes like an angel who descends from the heaven to help the injured person lying below. I love this monument very much. I think it's a very special, very touching uh, work of art with the, the, the meaning and significance that goes along with it. That's a very sensitive issue that many people struggle with. The stance of the Catholic Church during the war, there were documents, there were books, there were uh, the essays and, and PhDs and whatever written about the topics. Something for sure, I can tell you, there were places where Catholic clergy helped and did amazing job helping the Jews, like this particular person, Angelo Rota, Monsignor Rota, who issued thousands of baptismal documents. Supposedly, the people who carried the documents were baptized into Catholicism. Hence, there are no Jews anymore and they could be protected. He was aided also by another very special person, the ambassador, or at least he was a secretary in the embassy, a diplomat in the Spanish embassy in Budapest, again, issuing documents and help save the life of thousands of people. And then the most amazing thing happens. At one point, Spain closes down the embassy, at which point, a kind of a small middleman, kind I should even say like a swindler, somebody who was like Schindler was originally, somebody who came to profit, somebody who came to see how can he benefit from the situation. And when he saw that the Spanish embassy closed down, guess what he did? He figured people might not know that the ambassador is gone. He went in and presented himself as the new Spanish ambassador. His name was Joe, Giorgio Perlasca. They made a movie about him, which I highly recommend you watch. I put here the information about the movie. An amazing person. And he survived, he lived for many years later on, and luckily we were able to show our appreciation and give thanks to him in a major way. Perlaska. Another uh, embassy, another representative was the one from Portugal. There were two Portuguese consuls. At one point, because of the bombing, they started moving the Portuguese embassy away from, uh, from Budapest into the countryside, yet Jews went there and they were given these papers who protected them. And you see, they would put the pictures and uh, uh, the names of uh, these people. And that's how, again, many people have survived. Yet another new monument, not far from the Jewish community uh, headquarters. And we come to one of the most upsetting stories. You have seen these uh, pictures of the shoes on the invitation to the meeting tonight. And it says to commemorate the Jews who were killed in the Holocaust. I'd like to elaborate because this is unreal. Wallenberg and the other diplomats are active during the time when uh, the Americans uh, notify the Hungarian government that they should stop shipping all these Jews they were sending uh, away, mostly to Auschwitz. You know, and we'll come to Auschwitz later on, you know that until, uh, I would say, April, May 44, uh, 
uh, many of the Hungarian Jews were kind of intact. Hungary was not occupied. Only when the governor, the dictator, realized that he might change sides and he tried to negotiate armistice, that's when Germany has invaded uh, Hungary and they installed a fascist, a right-wing fascist as head of state. There was this infamous party, the Aerocross party, and their bastards were walking around in the street arresting Jews and the Jews said, you cannot do that. Look, I have this shoots paper, I have this protection paper. And they said, I don't care. And they tore the paper and they rounded the Jews and they led them, the Hungarians did, they led them to the banks of the Danube. Now we are in January 1945, the coldest winter in recorded history. We mentioned very often that winter when we talk about the March of Death, right? It was so cold in the continent. What they do now, they make the Jews leave all their belongings. Of course, shoes were something which was quite difficult to get by at, during that time in the war. Leave all their belongings, make them stand next to the embankment, tie them, three, of the, three people together, and shoot the central one. They will all fall into the water. Minutes later, with hypothermia, all three will die, and it took only one bullet, right? So clever, so efficient. So right behind the parliament building, we have this memorial, and it evokes so many thoughts, because you think, look, there is a child's shoes, and there is a lady's, and the men, and such unbelievable stories. So thousands of Jews were killed by the Hungarian fascists. The rumor is so amazing, and I couldn't believe it, but it was, uh, it was confirmed from few sources. When the Allies approached, and now the Germans are running away, the Jews who were still in town, can you imagine, there were some Jews helping the Germans find the way to escape from Budapest because the Germans were kinder than the Hungarians. For the long time the Germans were in town, they did not practice many of them the same atrocities as the Hungarian fascists. So that's a very special, very moving monument uh, uh, erected, as you can see, 15 years ago on the banks of the Danube. And we do what we do in many places. As you see, we bring some Yorzeit candles and we put the small pebbles or we put a flower like we would do in many other monuments. This lady is the minister uh, of uh, culture of Hungary. She came to put a flower and light a candle also here during Holocaust Memorial Day. Holocaust commemoration takes place in quite a few places, whether it's in the walls of the university. Uh, the Jews were rounded up when the Germans come, and now, as you remember, we are in the spring of 1944. They were rounded up into a ghetto. Tens of thousands of people crowded into miserable conditions, a wall was erected around the ghetto, and the conditions, of course, were appalling. Subsequently, the Jews who were sent away, uh, many of them, as we'll find out, were sent to Auschwitz, but also to other places. And like you have seen in other places, we have now a big project of the stumbling stones. You walk in the streets of Budapest and you see lots and lots of these stumbling stones outside the houses where Jewish people used to live, mentioning the date of their deportation, and if known, what was the destinations where they were deported, of course, their date of birth and the date of deportation. Another uh, beautiful uh, synagogue, which is in the area, and that is what I was talking about when I mentioned the Jews were there earlier. We found, and you'll see it in the museum when you visit, we found Jewish tombstones from the Roman town. Before it was Hungary, it was the Roman province of Pannonia, Pannonia. And the Roman legions were stationed there and we found lots of Jewish tombstones with Jewish names, Jews who came with the Romans. Of course, we mentioned the Van Zee Conference from 1942 and the number of Hungarian Jews. I have to remove a little so I can point it. I don't know if you see the screen that, I'm, uh, that I moved. You see 742,800 
hundred Jews still in Hungary, and now starts the deportations. What they did was first they started in the countryside, especially in the areas which didn't have lots of uh, ethnic uh, Hungarians by now, the areas which today will be in Ukraine, at the time they were in Slovakia, parts of Czechoslovakia, and in many of the towns they set up ghettos and comes April, May 44, deportation started. Later on, as you can see, the Jews of Budapest are being pushed and sent into the ghettos. Look at this picture. They arrested Jewish ladies on the street. Now we are in October 44. By now, the crematorium almost ceased to operate. The gas chamber are at the last phase of their operation in Auschwitz. And the only place in the continent where you have a significant number of Jews, over 100,000 Jews, is only in Budapest. Because by now, half a million Hungarian Jews from the countryside were already sent to their death in Auschwitz. Look at this homeless person in the ghetto. Some Jews were saved. We see a picture at the last moment, saved from deportation. You see, November 44, because as we know, the camps were not that much in operation. But before that, you see the Jews from the smaller towns, how they were sent to Auschwitz. I'll talk for a few minutes about Auschwitz because the stories that we tell now about Auschwitz in this location are really the stories of the Hungarian Jews. Almost half the people who were killed in Auschwitz were the Hungarian Jews. And in spite of the long years of operation of the Auschwitz extermination camp, most of the extermination took place in the very last months, in the last few months of operation, we, beginning in April, uh, 44. Even this railroad, which everybody knows, when you say Auschwitz, I think that is what comes to your mind. This was done in the spring of 44 by the Hungarian Jews for the Hungarian Jews. Because prior to that, the hundreds of thousands of people who were sent here were either marched from the train station in Oshvienchim, nearby Auschwitz, or from an unloading ramp, which is like a little less than a mile away from uh, Birkenau, and the people would be marched here in order to make it more efficient. Now that they have dozens and dozens of trains with many cars in them, loaded with thousands of Jews, they wanted to make it more efficient, and that's why they built these additional tracks so they can bring them. Tali has mentioned March of the Living, and this will be a typical picture of our visits there. We go to these tracks. We go to the place where many of these people, hundreds of thousands of them, that's where they took their last breath of air and they, they have uh, gone through the last minutes of their lives, literally, before they were sent further away. They were instructed, as you well know, to leave all their belongings um, and taken supposedly to be uh, to the showers, to be deloused, to whatever, to register. Look at these people just down from the train waiting for the selection, the famous pictures of the selections. And I like to talk about these pictures. Actually, these pictures are our main source of information, documented information, other than testimonies, of course. Uh, and they were all found in an album after the war by a very special lady. We'll see her picture in a while, and as I said, many of the Jews, they came from the Karpatorus, they came from the areas, the countryside, where today it is in Ukraine. That is such a shocking story now, that we often look at ourselves with total disbelief. The trains were coming in such numbers, and the people on them were so many, that the gas chambers could not contain them at the time. So they made them wait overnight for their turn to be pushed and shoved into the gas chamber. Uh, those of you who visited Auschwitz with Tali, with myself or otherwise, remember we walked by this place and we called it Mexico. So there was Canada where the good luck was if you could work with the belongings of the people and then there was 
this area, Mexico. I often think about this picture taken by mistake by American pilots. They were gonna take pictures of another plant. And one of the things that we see here is a group of people marching on their way to the gas chamber and the American pilot was above. This is uh, Rosa, Jac Li sorry, Lily Jacob. She is the one who discovered the album. She was recuperating in a hospital after the war and she opened the album and she saw a picture of her relatives, of her found people. And she kept the album. And then when it was known that she has it, people were writing to her and she sent people the pictures of the relatives. Only years later, she gave it to Yad Vashem. So we are still missing many pictures that were given out and we don't really know who these people are. We have to mention, since we talk, we all, as you noticed in the previous uh, places we visited in the previous countries, I find it a big duty and an honor to acknowledge and talk about the righteous among the nations. These people who risked their lives eventually this, uh, for example, this wonderful person, she ended up paying with her life for helping uh, the Jews. And she was uh, uh, nominated, of course, she was recognized as a righteous Gentile. Sam is this uh, wonderful person. He worked with, uh, with Monsignor Rota in helping the Jews. A new museum is opening up now in Budapest. Let's see what happens with the virus because they started and stopped, but it will be a magnificent new place, a bit away from center city, uh, a Holocaust memorial in Budapest. Another important person I like to mention is this beautiful lady. Born in Budapest, immigrated to Israel. As a Zionist, she became a member of a kibbutz and when the war is on, she volunteered and joined the British army to parachute across the borderline where she was captured and executed by the Hungarians. The songs she wrote were found in her cell and there is hardly any ceremony that we don't play the music and sing these songs because they are very special. I enclosed, embedded her story, but also put here the lyrics of these very special songs that she wrote. Before we leave, we'll take a side trip, again a little tourism and Jewish tourism at that, to the small quaint little artist village of Saint Andre. Saint Andre was a village settled during the Ottoman Empire by ethnic Serbs and some Croats, and then it became very very popular among artists. Hungarian artists moved in the first half of the 20th century and set shop here, about 200 artists, um, writers, poets, uh, sculptors, painters, whatever, very picturesque narrow lanes of the town. I'd like to visit with you two museums of Jewish artists. One of them is Margit Kovac, a most unique, sensitive lady, and she became a wonderful, wonderful artist. She survived the war, and she did from nature, to Greek mythology. This is really herself, it's mother and daughter. I love very much the tenderness, the, som the soft movement, and you will love her work. Another couple was Amos Imre and his Catholic wife, Anna Margit. He was killed in 44. She survived and she burst, exploding. Is this God? Where is God? Where was God? And so on. And we'll visit their museum. His art, I love very, very much. A small oddity, the smallest synagogue in the world and the first one to open in Hungary after the Holocaust 22 years ago. Really, you cannot really get even 10 people inside. It's so tiny, there is no way to move. But the fact was that they put a synagogue where 200 Jews from this town, they were the artists and the intellectuals, they were taken and they were killed. So outside the synagogue on the wall, we have this commemorative flat mentioning it. I could have spent long time, but we have to proceed and we'll take now the road to go to Vienna. It's a couple hours drive, which is what most people do, but I would like to suggest when you take this trip, don't take the road, take the boat. Enjoy a boat ride on the Danube River. It's a magnificent ride with scenic views, 
with beautiful castles and buildings and palatial mansions and uh, magnificent churches and fortresses and whatever, until we get a few hours later to Vienna. Again, the territory, again, the population. Look at the size of the Jewish population now. Again, some people will not identify, but definitely, I would say, definitely some 10,000. Look what was the number before the war and how many of them were killed during the war. When we talk about Austria, in this particular case, we concentrate on the area of um, Vienna and subsequently we'll go to the infamous concentration camp of Mauthausen. When you go to Vienna, you cannot stop adoring the beautiful architecture and the monuments, the magnificent palaces, the main palace, the imperial, not just royal, is the Hofburg, with many pavilions from the front, from the back, magnificent architecture. You drive a little out of center of town is the Schönbrunn Palace, again, and a magnificent one with gorgeous gardens and the orangeries and the gloriettes. Closer to town, the Belvedere, again, a magnificent palace with some stunning interiors with art and furniture. And again, the beautiful gardens. Same goes for modern architecture. For example, I love the architecture of these buildings. This is the United Nations headquarters for Europe. It is situated here in Vienna in the magnificent buildings. So here we look at the town. We'll take a, a walk again in the pedestrian street, like many European towns, they took the main street and converted them into a pedestrian mall, linking the many different uh, buildings with many monuments that are scattered all over the place. They have their famous theater, again, a magnificent 19th century architecture and the famous uh, Sacher Hotel in, across the street from it is the opera uh, building, uh, which again is a very, very nice opera, again, with so much history, so many pieces were performed here for the first time. The National Library, another beautiful building with beautiful decoration and art and the statues and all these wooden uh, uh, shelves and whatever. The Sacher Hotel, I'm afraid, uh, is an, a, a, a proof of what I said. The only contribution of the Viennese kitchen is the Sacher Dort, which is still being served in this, in this hotel. Brace yourself, and I shouldn't do that. I do it with the, all of the respect. Brace yourself for maybe the dullest, most boring piece of pasta you've ever had in your life, but that's the claim to fame. Look at the, uh, at the courthouse, the Palace of Justice, another magnificent building with these regal staircases and these marble and panels. In sheer abstract and total difference, contrast to it, is the crazy houses built by Prince Hof Hunderwasser, a Jewish artist who has been very active. Those of you from New Zealand will know also his work in New Zealand. You must have seen his work in many different places. He doesn't believe in straight lines, as you can see. So even the floors are done in such a crooked way. And why should the tree only grow in the street? Why shouldn't it grow on the balcony or from the window? So he created some very crazy uh, buildings and this uh, particular neighborhood is a very special one. We started with the Jews and here we are in one of the main squares in downtown along the pedestrian road. On the right hand side, we notice a building that looks very strange. Look at it, it's like sealed from all directions, like a fortified bunker. And that is the Holocaust Memorial. They kind of entomb everything inside. Everything is done to not only to lock it in, but to enshrine it, to protect it. And this is the street where we have the next door Jewish uh, museum, the headquarters of the Jewish community. The magnificent synagogue around interiors, very unusual and very, very beautiful. And we'll start talking about the unfolding of the events and to me, this is something very special to mention. You know that the Germans took already 
uh, the Sudetenland. Subsequently, they penetrated and took Bohemia and Moravia, but that is not enough. Now they want to restore some great notion of great Germany, and they annex Austria. This is the famous Anschluss. You see the date, March 12, 1938. What I'd like to tell you is, in order to um, legitimize everything, uh, facing these crowds that were cheering, welcoming Hitler as he crosses the border into Austria. Remember, he was from Austria. Now start the atrocities. They are Austrians, not necessarily all Germans, but they're all members of the Nazi party or members of the various places. The Jews are supposed to brush the street with their toothbrushes. Jews are supposed to do all kinds of things, and that leads to the crystal night. Before that, I mentioned that in order to solidify and substantiate their presence, they made some kind of a census. They made like a poll. They asked people to come and participate, and what are they going to vote for? 91% of the Austrians voted in favor of the Anschluss, which did not prevent Austria to be among the first people after the war to run to the Marshall Plan officials and ask for help as somebody who was occupied by the Nazis. That is something that I still get very, very upset. You know, the Crystal Knight initiation of pogroms that took place concurrently in dozens of locations in Germany and in Austria burning, looting, uh, shops arresting and killing people, synagogues are set on fire, horrible atrocities, and the next day, facing all this destruction, the Jews were blamed for causing all the damage, and a fine was imposed of one billion, billion Reichsmark to pay for the damage that was caused supposedly by the Jews. I guess you know the story of this magnificent painting, which you can see today, it's still there uh, in uh, Manhattan, and you must have seen the story, the woman in gold, and it was taken and was kept in the Belvedere Palace, which we have seen a few minutes ago. They simply came into their house and took the painting away, and remember how long and how hard they had to fight to regain it. I will skip many parts of the atrocities, but I'd like to talk about one of the main places the Jews were sent fro to from uh, Vienna and neighboring towns, and that was the concentration camp of Mauthausen. Look at these people. They've just disembarked from a 10 days train ride in the open. There was a car that was not covered, there was no roof. And look at their condition after they have been there. And here we have some of the figures and numbers. And I have to say that when we say Mauthausen, most people will relate only to the camp, but actually most of the victims and the people, the inmates, were sent to three other uh, uh, camps, Gusen, Gusen 1, Gusen 2, Gusen 3, and that's where most of the atrocities we're done. Look at the prisoners waiting disinfection in the garage yard of the camp. And this is one of the most incredible places. They had to carry granite blocks that were sometimes heavier than their own weight up these cliffs, 180 steps to the top of the quarry. And they're working in the quarry. Sometimes there was a work that was needed, and sometimes you never know. It was just to wear them out, just as a matter of treating them badly. Some of the women who survived, some of the men who survived welcoming the liberators as the US Army comes in, and of course, the horrors that are being discovered, the bodies, the piles of uh, bodies, and the survivors who look so emaciated, like walking skeletons. Today, this is a place which is visited by many people. I must... Uh, Salute the Austrian government who makes sure every single school kid, every single one, will be taken on field trips to visit the various camps, mostly and mainly in this place, which is Mauthausen. Uh, people were killed here. There was a killing by gas, but not in the, the likes we have seen in uh, 
uh, Auschwitz. There were some experimental uh, cabins, but mostly it was the mobile gas units in the truck with the hose uh, linking the, the fumes from the exhaust into the car where people were put in. And it was not only, of course, not only Jews, they have killed many other nationals in this camp. Here we will mention a very unique person. We don't know much about uh, uh, these uh, people, unfortunately. When we visited Lithuania, we talked about Sugihara, the Japanese ambassador. This one was a Chinese ambassador, again, against the instructions given by his superiors. He issued these papers and he managed to save the life of thousands of people by giving them these visas to go to Shanghai. If you remember in the last, uh, in the last program, those of you who were with us the last time, we talked about Germans who were kind and some of them were killed. This one uh, was killed. Anton Schmidt was killed by the Germans when they realized he was helping uh, the Jews. And again, here we have even much more than we have in Budapest. We have hundreds and hundreds of the stumbling stones mentioning the names of the people who lived in that address. They, are always, uh, they will always be found either on the floor or on the wall of the building which housed Jewish people at the time. So we acknowledge and we thank them very much for what they do. We are gonna celebrate our new year. Now we are starting to restore a tradition that Tali would remember from our childhood, which was not that long ago, when we used to send these beautiful hand-painted cards to relatives and friends. And I'd like to wish everybody a very happy and healthy new year. Look at what we like to do now. You know, we're supposed to dip the apples into honey, so we will have a new year that will be sweet. In order to be inclusive, and I wish people will do it all over, look what we do. We'll take apples from both two different colors and we'll cut out the heart and we position it to show our tender friendship and love to each other, even though we are different, our heart is at somebody else. I like this idea very much. And I hope that many of you will do it, even on this coming uh, new year. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I rushed you through because I could have taken much longer and talk about many more stories and many more people, but we had a limited amount of time and I hope I was able to convey a little of the stories. Absolutely, and, and, and thank you so much, Jacob, for your whirlwind tour of, uh, of Hungary and, and Austria. And as, you, as we said, on the 1st of October, we will, um, we will do another tour of uh, the Czech Republic and of uh, Slovakia and continue uh, with that. Um, there are, I, I invited people to post some questions and uh, there are some comments, first of all, by Maria Slow about, uh, and, and I'm not sure that you know, but the first air reconnaissance photos that were taken um, of Auschwitz was taken by uh, Squadron 60 or 60 Squadron, Photo Recon Squadron of the South African Air Force. And uh, uh, subsequently, they took many, many of those photographs under the RAF, under the British uh, um, the British uh, Air Force. So just an interesting connection to, to South Africa. Very much so, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just very quickly looking. Um, um, Jacob, maybe if I may start while people are uh, uh, posting their, their questions. When you uh, visit Austria and, and you visit beyond Vienna, Mauthausen, uh, Salzburg, and, and other, other places, how is the, the period of the Second World War and the Holocaust marked in different places? You showed us briefly the book burning memorial, the Jewish uh, memorial, but from your experience, what do you see when you visit Austria? Austria has done a great job 
in commemorating, in acknowledgement, and in education, which to me is the most important stuff. It's one thing to build memorials and we go and we visit, we take pictures, we say how interesting. The big work is education, as you well know, and I know that you well do. I know that that's what you do in your beautiful establishment. You put such an emphasis on education to everybody. So Austria has done a wonderful job and still does a wonderful uh, job uh, with the, the, the theme of educating the young people. Austria, for example, has, and you can see it in many places around the world, this, and also in Israel, they have uh, a military service where everybody has to be drafted, it's compulsory, but if somebody comes and say, there are conscientious objectors, you know, for whatever reason, they don't wanna serve in the army, no problem. You will be drafted, not for a military service, you will do some kind of civil service, community or otherwise, and out of the 220 some positions you can choose, over a hundred have to do with Jews. Either you will be a docent in a Holocaust museum somewhere in Europe, or you'll come to Israel and work with the elderly. You might be taken care, of course, these people are dwindling now, but years ago, the, the, the chances in life can offer the most incredible surprises, right? A young person will come and help take care of an elderly Jew whose grandfather has tortured and caused to whatever. So Austria is very much aware of their past. Uh, there is a rise big time of uh, neo-Nazism, as the case is in Germany, as the case is in many places around the continent. Most Europeans will object to it, especially after the story, and I didn't talk about him, maybe I'll talk about him in a, in a minute. Somebody who made it to the high ranking position in the German administration who was stationed in Greece, subsequently in Yugoslavia. I will not go into the details of his participation, but he did have great responsibility and horrible atrocities and uh, thousands of Jews who were sent to their extermination. After the war, he was never court-martialed, he was never brought to trial. Actually, he went even higher and higher in official ranks to the point that he became Secretary General of the United Nations. He visited Israel, he we treated him with wine and dine and whatever royally. And then they made him the President of Austria. And that's when his Nazi past was revealed. We were so appalled, we and most everybody else. He became a persona non grata in most countries around the world. He couldn't travel anywhere. And the Austrians, many of them said, how come you don't welcome our president into, our, into your country? Took a while for everybody to acknowledge and to realize. And I think that was a shifting, you know, a turning point. That has shifted the balance to look in their eyes, to look in the mirror, to look into their parents, like they did in Germany, like they hopefully will do in some other countries where they still have difficulties acknowledging. And no question, Austria is doing a great, great job. I will use this opportunity that I talk about education to quote one of my favorite lines, if not the very favorite one when it comes to education. You think education is expensive? Try ignorance, because I really believe that lots of the problems in the world stem and come from the ignorance of so many people. We want to avoid it. Let's invest in education in so many fields. That is, that should be the choice. Thank you, Jacob. And uh, of course, the Kurt Waldheim affair shook the world and uh, in a way changed also Austria to to do much more active. Uh, and Ian Jaffe is, is saying, Jacob, amazing lecture. Whilst you commend Austrians for doing a wonderful education uh, and, and, and job, and he agrees with you, do you not think that they ignore Austrian complicity in the Holocaust by claiming to be the first country to be occupied by the Nazis? So the first victim kind of... Uh, Issue. That was in 45, but over the years they do acknowledge, they do realize, and 
they kind of take responsibility to the point that sometimes I have to go and say, it's okay, my friend, it's not you. It was your father or grandfather or aunt or uncle and hug them and kiss them when they are weeping, you know? But they do, absolutely, they do acknowledge. So Emily Grennan is asking, did all the ambassadors you discussed in Budapest work together or were they doing this on their own? Or can you explain a little bit more? So mostly they did on their own, but they were inspired and motivated by the actions and the personality and the big push and move of Raoul Wallenberg. There was no real cooperation like on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. But when they realized that they have the power, not the authority, because most of them were not authorized by their governments. Many of them did it against clear instructions issued by their governments. So they did know each other, of course, and they were motivated and inspired by the likes, by Raoul Wallenberg, yes. People like Perlaska, he, he, he joined the ranks much after everybody else, and it was his own initiative. And he did an incredible job at that. Absolutely. And we, we showed the film that you mentioned at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center oh, yes. about two years ago. Unbelievable. What a character. Uh, you know, his Italian connections and his, oh, unbelievable, unbelievable personality. Um, Veronica Phillips, who is, a, a, as I mentioned before, a Holocaust survivor from Budapest, uh, she was one of those that the power dropped and the internet dropped uh, together with few others that have issues in their part of, uh, of Johannesburg. Catherine uh, Boyd, our education manager, is with her on the line and Catherine is going to give a message from Veronica. Kath? Hi Tali, hi everyone. I've got Veronica on the line and she'd like to uh, make a comment and send a message to everyone. So I'm gonna, hopefully this will work. Okay, Veronica, it's, it's up to you, it's over to you. Hello? There, okay, everyone can hear you. Yes? Yes, we can hear you. What do you want to say, Veronica? What I want to say, I am sitting here in the front of the computer by the Danube, where all the shoes are taken off before they shoot them in, they chain them together to save, uh, to shoot them. Because one was taken down with the, the other one with themselves. So they wanted to make sure everybody was floating in the Danube. And these are the shoes. This was made not a Jewish artist, it was a Christian artist who had a good feeling towards the Jews. And this is absolutely tragic. As you go and see it from one end to the other, all the shoes, Obviously, you can't take it off if it is screwed in, but it is terrible to think that all these shoots belong to a human being, but who killed them were not human, because animals don't do this to each other, what they did to the Jews. Thank you, Veronica. So she was talking about the memorial that um, Jacob showed us, the photograph of the shoes along the edge of the Danube. Thank you for that message, Veronica. Um, darling, I am so upset that I couldn't be there mm. because it's different when you hear it from somebody who was there yeah. than from a book. A book doesn't talk to you like another human. No, you're right, and um, we missed you tonight. Please tell Veronica, please tell Veronica that people like Tali and myself and many others who are so deeply involved in Holocaust education, we took it upon ourselves to carry on her message so the next generations will be aware of what happened, that we will be a spokesperson for her in many years to come 
so these stories will not be forgotten. So please tell her that many of us are inspired by her life, inspired by what she says, and we are committed to continue doing the job. Did you hear Excellent. that, Veronica? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank All right. you. And you know, we might be able to do that again, and then I make sure I will be <laughs> in with you there. Absolutely. So my computer couldn't let me down mm -hmm. when I am next to you. Yes. <laughs> we'll make a plan for next time. Thank you so much for speaking to everyone, Veronica. Oh, thank you, thank, thank you. I could have said a lot more that God didn't want me to, and that's how it is. Thank you so much. Darling, Dovi, you are a godsend, and even you couldn't help me, because now I am looking at the computer, it's dead as a dodo. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you, thank you, Catherine. And, and for the, all of you that know Veronica, she's just the most amazing, amazing human being, uh, was a lecturer of genetics in, uh, at Wits University. She will celebrate 94 years old in, uh, in November and uh, absolutely amazing educator, sharing his story with so many groups. So we are so honored to have her with us. Ali, if I may mention, you mentioned you show the movie Perlaska. There are many movies, but one of them I'd like to point is The Music Box. Do you remember many years ago about how she finds out that her father was among the perpetuators? And another book which has to do with these Hungarian Jews, another movie, is Out of the Ashes. Out of the Ashes. Maybe I'll send it to you so you can add it to the list we you are sending to the people about the life of Dr. Gisela Ferrell, a Hungarian Jewish doctor in Auschwitz, out of the ashes. That will be wonderful if you can send us some more ideas of books and, and films. Definitely. Uh, Mervyn de Vesovitz is, is asking, the movie of the woman in gold um, uh, that you, you spoke about, showed horrendous process of trying to get reparation, art reparation. What is the present situation? Do you know anything yes, about yes. that? Yes, yes. It was purchased by Ronald Lauder for a huge amount of money, and it is hanging in his gallery in Manhattan, off Fifth Avenue, not far from the Metropolitan Museum, at the Neue Gallery. It is hanging there along with some other masterpieces of the time and the location with Egon Schiel and some other masters of that school, late 19th century, uh, yes, Vienna and Austria. It is available, everybody can come inside and see it. They offer a docent guided tours in the Neue Galerie and I highly recommend to go and visit. It's a magnificent building with beautiful collection and the special story of that painting. Everything you saw in the movie is based on truth. They had to fight very, very hard. All these different, you know, levels of the Viennese of the Austrian courts. Uh, and maybe the last question before we um, before before we let you go, Kim Alpert, Kimi, that was with us in March of the Living, and she is joining us from Sydney. It's like four o'clock in the morning. Uh, don't understand, Kimi, what you're doing, but she's asking, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't the Danube nicknamed the Red Danube because of what happened there, uh, the, the, the amount of blood in, uh, that it turned the water red? Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine thousands of people being shot into the frozen Danube? Yes, that's what they called it at the time. It evoked such emotions and the name was Red Danube, yeah. Thank you, thank you. We, we uh, really are very grateful to you, uh, Jacob, for taking us uh, all around uh, those sites and, and, and touching on so many different stories and, uh, and exploring uh, different aspects of uh, Budapest and Vienna. Looking very much forward for everyone to join us uh, to the next tour on the 1st of October of uh, Prague, Theresienstadt, Bratislava, and so on. And, uh, 
and uh, many more after that, hopefully uh, either this year or next year. And um, just to also invite everyone uh, on the 22nd of uh, September, we are going to do a very different tour, also a, a, a kind of a virtual tour, but this time it will be in Kazimierz, Krakow, Poland, with a golf cart, going to drive around with festive alt uh, that are from Krakow to explore some of the sites, but also of the issues of commemoration and memorialization in today's Krakow. So please do join us. Uh, this will be a members only event. For all of you that are members, please join us. If you're not a member yet, please join our membership, uh, uh, membership list. Very, very easy thing to do. And we are offering members only events every month. Again, thank you, Jacob. Thank you to all of you for joining. Thank you to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center team. Shana Tova, Happy New Year. Absolutely all the best. Jacob, last word, word from you. <laughs> Shana Tova, Happy and Healthy New Year, everybody. And hopefully soon we should hear the next words. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. So hopefully we'll all hear these words very, very soon. <laughs> and can take a flight and go with you to all those wonderful places. <laughs> 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 good evening, good night, and uh, Shana Tova. Shana Tova. <laughs>